Radio Free Maine presents Howard Zinn, speaking on Failure to Quit, Reflections of an Optimistic Historian. June 21st, 1996, Concord, New Hampshire, sponsored by the New Hampshire Peace Action. Recorded for Radio Free Maine by Roger Leisner. We now join Michael Ferber as he introduces Howard Zinn, speaking on Failure to Quit, Reflections of an Optimistic Historian. Here are two or maybe all of this wonderful book that took a view of American history rather different from the one that prevails in the opinion makers in Washington. All these people were reading about Columbus discovering America from the point of view of the Arawak Indians, or the Civil War from the viewpoint of black people, or the whole history from the viewpoint of women or oppressed minorities. It's a book that now we almost take for granted because so many other people now are offering whole courses in themes like that. History from below, history from vantage points that are not usually included in the standard textbook. But Howard was perhaps the first and certainly the most thorough uh, in putting this together into a whole book, uh, giving us a coherent viewpoint. And it was a marvelous thing when it came out and remains a marvelous book. Howard is a teacher, first of all. I consider myself one of his students, though I never actually took a formal course from him, because I got to know him in an impressionable age of 22, uh, as a suffering graduate student at Harvard in English and needing a different sort of mentor at a time when I was getting active in the anti-war movement, and found him, as many others of my generation did, not only teaching and lecturing on American history and American government, but being a kind, of, a kind of example, a person, a person who did what he lectured about, no. and it was available almost any time when we needed him. I want to read just a page or two from his recent memoir, "You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train," a title of which I <laughs> Not the most stirring pages in this book, though there are many that are very stirring indeed, but pages I think are perhaps most typical and give a perhaps most ex exemplary slice of Howard's life. Howard was arrested, not for the first and certainly not for the last time, in 1970 for sauntering and loitering. <laughs> that is to say, he was blocking the busloads of draftees at the Boston Army base with another group. He was arrested, he was tried, he was convicted, and with a couple of others who refused to pay a $21 fine. I know his salary wasn't very good at BU, uh, John Silver saw to that, but $21 was more than he wished to pay at that time, and he was told by the judge to take it over and show up in court a couple of days later, but he was scheduled to be at Johns Hopkins University at just that time debate Charles Frankel on the philosophy of civil disobedience. <laughs> <laughs> so he went there instead, showing up in court. And he writes, I was at the Washington airport early the next morning to return to Boston where I planned to meet my 11 o'clock class. I phoned Roz, who told me, the news on the radio says you cannot be located and there's a warrant out for your arrest. <laughs> Again, I would have felt foolish skipping my class on law and justice in America, <laughs> which civil disobedience was one of the topics of discussion in order to submit to the court. I always believed that teachers taught more by what they did than by what they said. I thought, I'm not going to do anything heroic, I'm not going underground, I'm just going to go to my class, but if the authorities want me, they'll have to come for me. From the Boston airport, I went directly to my class. The students were wide-eyed. I wish I'd been in there. <laughs> You're wanted by the police, they said. Aren't you supposed to turn yourself in? I said I would, after class. <laughs> there was no need for me to do anything. When the class ended, and I walked outside, two detectives were waiting for me, with a university official there, too, clearly nervous. <laughs> this is typical of Howard in many ways. He taught by teaching, by lecturing, by writing, and by doing. He always helped younger people feel it was not only right, but normal, healthy, 
to be involved in an arrest. He says in a, in a sentence that begins one of his chapters here that it's an intense educational experience to get arrested. <laughs> That's quite right. He made it even seem fun to stand up for something or sit down for something and get arrested. His warmth and his humor were as important to us as his history lessons and his serious moral arguments. So there are thousands of people who are not do not do not only admire Howard but love him. I am one of those. Please welcome Howard. Thank you. I think I'll introduce Michael Ferba. <laughs> well, uh, well, uh, yeah, I will say something. Uh, about the first time I laid eyes on uh, Michael was in 1967. Uh, you may think he was three years old then, but no, he, he, he was uh, a Harvard student at that time. And we had just had an anti-war rally on the Boston Common. Can you all hear me? Yeah? yeah? Not very well. Not very well. Ah. You may be lucky. <laughs> okay. Uh, how's this? Is this better? All right. I, I may collapse uh, after 15 minutes of this, but... Um, and we had just uh, had this rally on the Boston Common, and we marched to the Arlington Street Church. Uh, it was a wonderful rally on the Common, and, uh, and then uh, there we all gathered in the Arlington Street Church, and, uh, uh, and someone uh, held up one of the historic candles of the church, and young men came forward with their draft cards. Uh, uh, and a few people spoke, and uh, the most, to me, the most striking speech was from somebody I, uh, I didn't know. Uh, yeah. And a uh, young guy, uh, eloquent, passionate speech. That was Michael Ferber. And... Uh, and the fact that he is, you know, he's here today, the fact that he's been working uh, with the peace movement, to me is, is symptomatic of uh, what has happened to so many, so many people who are touched by the movements of the 60s and who are, who are still uh, in there, out there, <laughs> uh, up there, down there, <laughs> uh, doing things. Uh, the, uh, this uh, little book of mine, uh, that was just auctioned off for an outrageous price. <laughs> I wouldn't pay that much for it. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 I just should tell you how I came by, by that title, Failure to Quit. Uh, it, um, a bunch of us uh, well, actually, 550 of us <laughs> were arrested. Uh, you may get the impression that I'm always being arrested from all of this. No, it's, you know, I go to the movies. I, there are other things. And, uh, but uh, this, this was in, a, in the, you may recall, in the mid-80s when uh, President Reagan declared uh, a, an embargo on a blockade of Nicaragua. Uh, on the supposition that Nicaragua uh, formed a, an immediate threat to the security of the United States. Uh, I guess it came from a, uh, a report made by the Kissinger Commission, which uh, Reagan had set up to study uh, what was going on in Central America. And, and the Kissinger Commission concluded that uh, it was a very short air ride from Nicaragua to Harlingen, Texas. I don't know why they would go to Harlingen, Texas, but presumably from there they could take a Greyhound to Washington, D.C., and, uh, and that would be the end for us. 
But anyway, in protest, many of us, many of you probably here, signed the Pledge of Resistance in those years. There's 50,000, 60,000 people around the country signed the Pledge of Resistance saying that if the United States government took action against the government of Nicaragua, that we would do something to resist. And so we, had, we occupied the uh, federal building in Boston and uh, 550 of us uh, refused to leave, uh, were arrested, uh, spent the night, uh, and uh, you know those nights. Uh, years later, people will say, meet somebody and say, remember that night we spent together? Uh, <laughs> and people ara standing around don't understand. But... Uh, so we, they said, we were arraigned and they set a trial date. And then I got a notice in the mail saying uh, that they had dropped the charges. You know, there were too many of us, <laughs> right, to deal with. Of course, which is a lesson uh, for any movement, right? Uh, if you're going to get arrested, find a lot of people to be arrested with. Really make it difficult for them. This is what the IWW used to do back in the early 20th century when one of the wobbly labor organizers would get arrested in the town in the West and uh, for just getting up on a street and speaking and, and, uh, and when that person was put in jail a hundred other wobblies would come in, they would be put in jail then 500 more would come in, then 3,000 would come in from all over the country and it was impossible for the town to take care of them and they would all be released. Anyway uh, I got this notice saying they dropped charges, and for the first time I knew what the formal charge against us was, and the formal charge against us was failure to quit, <laughs> you see. And uh, it came, came out, you know, one of these old New England statutes, you know, failure to trespass statutes, failure to quit the premises. And so I, I thought that that tells you so much about people in the movement, and that's what keeps movements alive and uh, and that's what brings about change when change takes place because uh, people simply will fail to quit uh, so um, on the way up here I was trying to think of what I would say uh, I know you think speakers are always well organized and <laughs> no no uh, <laughs> and I I thought, I can't just tell you, there's no point in my telling you about all the bizarre and things that are taking place, right? That uh, bizarre and terrible things that are going on, and we, we know that, but all you have to do is turn on the six o'clock news, you can get that there, you know. Uh, I remember about my, uh, my mother, before she died, uh, she died in 1988, and uh, she was... Um, and in just that last period before she died, uh, when I, I would be visiting her, uh, I would go shopping for her, and she would tell tell me, "Make sure you bring back a copy of the, you know, uh, the National Enquirer." You know? <laughs> My mother had about a sixth grade education, although she was a very wise woman in many ways. Her reading consisted of movie magazines and. Uh, tabloids and the star and the national inquiry the things you you know the things you see in the in the supermarkets right and I always hope for a long line in the supermarkets so I'll <laughs> have time to read those things because you know I, I don't want anybody to see me buying one of them. <laughs> but I, I was always intrigued with they would have a headline you know wonderful headline like George Washington found alive in New Hampshire you know. uh, <laughs> Uh, but so I, I thought, you know, why is my mother interested in these <laughs> bizarre stories? And then I realized after a while that what I was reading in the New York Times was much more bizarre, <laughs> you see. Uh, and, you know, a lot like, happened to have it with me, of course. Uh, Spy satellite agency heads are ousted for lost money. <laughs> and this is, this, is, this is the outfit that uh, had the job 
of building satellites to keep track of what the Russians are doing, and they lost track of two billion dollars. <laughs> you see? Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, or, uh, did you know that they built in California on the border? Did you know that they built in California on the border between California and Mexico a steel wall. Did you hear about that? Yeah. yeah. Amazing, isn't it? A steel wall to keep, uh, well, yeah, to keep Mexican immigrants out, right? Uh, I, I thought about this. Uh, you know, it was the Berlin Wall, right, had come down. Everybody was so happy. And here we were erecting a steel wall. Uh, and... Uh, and they, the, the, wall, the wall is in three sections of 14 miles. Now you know that the border between California and Mexico has to be more than 14 miles. <laughs> but they built this steel wall and they found that the immigrants were coming in in much larger numbers in other parts of the border, <laughs> you see. Uh, but, uh, anyway. Uh, and then, just w one more item, this from just the other day in the Boston Globe, uh, that you know that the, they're trying to work out a, a, an international pact for uh, uh, an end to nuclear testing, and there's a lot of jockeying back and forth, and uh, uh, apparently uh, India has, has asked that the nation that before she signs this pact to stop nuclear testing, that the nations that have nuclear weapons should agree to dismantle their nuclear weapons. Well, this obviously is an outrageous request. <laughs> you know. uh, but uh, the, this is a report that the United States and France have signed an agreement. So, quote, so that each nation can help the other maintain its nuclear arsenal after an expected treaty bans all test explosions. <laughs> yeah. oh. Well, well, actually, I have one more little item down here. I'm like an auctioneer who always finds one more thing to auction <laughs> off. Uh, in fact, I may auction this off after... <laughs> uh, uh, but... In Robert Gates' new book, please, <laughs> I'm, no, I'm not going to tell you the title of it, I'm not going to tell you where to buy it, uh, but, uh, you know, he was, he was the CIA for a long time, and, and he writes his memoirs about being in the CIA for all these presidents, uh, and, uh, but he tells about this one time, uh, and this was late in the Carter administration, when the, uh, that special sort of uh, outfit under the mountain in Colorado with all that secret equipment uh, uh, got the word and then they sent that the Russians had launched 220 nuclear missiles at the United States. Immediately contacted uh, Brzezinski, because that's who you contact. Just, I, you should know that. If you're ever in trouble, contact Brzezinski. And Brzezinski was Carter's national security advisor, and uh, Brzezinski uh, prepared to notify Carter to immediately send the American nuclear arsenal on its way. Then another message came from Colorado saying that no, it wasn't 220 missiles, it was 2,200 missiles that were launched towards the United States. Well, Brzezinski moved even faster towards the phone, and then another message came saying it was a mistake. <laughs> well, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's what we face, <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, and uh, fortunately, uh, 
we have a better opportunity, I think, than, than ever before in the history of the peace movement to really build a movement for the uh, removal of all nuclear weapons from the arsenals of the world. The Veterans for Peace organization has set a, a target uh, for the year 2000. I don't know, are there any members of the Veterans for Peace here? Oh, well. Yeah. Uh, I'm a member of that organization, I'm proud to say, and uh, uh, Veterans for Peace has pledged that by the year 2000, that's the goal, 2000, to uh, uh, war to be abolished. Finally, the words of the Kellogg-Briand Pact of 1928. I remember being in school and learning about the Kellogg-Briand Pact of 1928. That's the kind of things they used to teach you in school, right? And learn the words to the, you know, and uh, the pact that the nation signed not, it was not long after World War I. And, and they, uh, all the nations of the world signed a pact renouncing war as an instrument of national policy. Uh, we're still working on that. And Veterans for Peace is working on that. So, uh, I think all that, all that I can do is suggest to you, uh, as strongly as I can, uh, that the things we do are not in vain. Uh, the thing I run into uh, most often, and I know all of us are familiar with this, is a depressed friend, <laughs> a friend depressed by the state of the world, uh, and, uh, and we run into it not only in our friends, we run into it in ourselves, although we very often don't like to admit it. Uh, and I think that happens when we lose historical perspective, uh, when we, and when we watch the six o'clock news, and and don't think beyond that. And when we get our, when we, despite all that we say about sus being suspicious of the media and all that we know rationally about how we are misled by the media, we're still subject to it. We still turn it on, we still listen to it, we still read all that the media can, can tell us are stories that depress us about the state of the world. And in order to get over that, you have to get away from the six o'clock news and they will get away from the major networks uh, and away from the New York and uh, the news leader? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the union. The, uh, the union leader. The news that, leader, we <laughs> And, uh, and, uh, and gather with people, with other people, and meet other people and, uh, uh, and realize how many how many folk there are everywhere who feel the same way we do about war, about children, uh, about the need to uh, take the enormous resources of this country and, and use those resources for, for decent and human purposes. Uh, I, uh, I can't tell you how encouraged I get by just going around the country and talking and meeting with groups and uh, this, this group here in New Hampshire. Uh, this morning I was at a gathering in, uh, actually not far from home, in Sherborne, Massachusetts, the Peace Abbey. Have any of you been to the Peace Abbey in Sherborne, Massachusetts? Well, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing uh, that was set up some years ago by a man named Louis Ronda, who, who told me today uh, when I was there that he, uh, in college, he had been a, a hawk, had been in... in favor of the Vietnam War. And the movement, the movement, uh, began to change his thinking, as it changed the thinking of millions and millions of people. And at a certain point he decided that he would devote his life to peace. And now he and his wife and his two little children have this beautiful little enclave in this town in Massachusetts. And this, uh, it's sort of a little farm. And on it they have uh, a great sculpture of Gandhi. And the sculpture of Gandhi caused a great commotion in the town when it was erected. It was something shocking. <laughs> the, it so happens that their farm is right next 
to the town's war memorial. <laughs> and so there's the war memorial. And there is Gandhi looking at the war memorial. <laughs> uh, and they tried actually to, to prevent the statue from going up, but he, he fought it and, and, uh, and, and there is the statue. Uh, and there to this Peace Abbey, people come, and pe townspeople have begun to come. Even some people who originally opposed the statue have begun to come around to the Peace Abbey. The Peace Abbey is also a school. Uh, it's a school for kids who are, have difficulties in one way, physical or mental. And, and these kids come to this school and uh, there's something magical about the atmosphere of people. It has an effect on the, these children's ability to learn. Amazing, pro just met a young, uh, I was introduced to a young man, 14 years old, and they told me, and who, who during the little ceremony that we had there at the Peace Abbey, got up and, and read a poem. With, it was obvious he had difficulty reading the poem, but he read the poem. And they, last year when he came to the school, he could not read and did not speak. Uh, so here was this, uh, here were all these people gathered today for a special ceremony at Peace Abbey to honor some people who had been involved in, 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 the, in the peace movement. And I thought about that, and I thought about coming here to New Hampshire tonight, and I thought about how a few, oh, uh, not, not very long ago, uh, earlier this spring, uh, I was in New York for the uh, 75th birthday party for Daniel Berrigan. And uh, were any of you there? Uh, I was looking around for, <laughs> but uh, it's, but there were 800 people at this birthday party. Uh, we needed a big cake. <laughs> and, uh, but it was a wonderful, wonderful gathering of people from all over the country who had been active in the peace movement over the years. And people who had engaged in civil disobedience and people who had been to jail. Uh, I had lots of people come over, up to me and say, you remember when you testified in my trial? Uh, and, uh, and uh, Dave Dellinger was there, and Allen Ginsberg was there, and uh, uh, Daniel Ellsberg was there, and uh, people who had engaged in all these plowshares actions over the years. And, and it, uh, it heartened you to see that, that he, here were these hundreds and hundreds of people who, who are still in there persisting, refusing to quit all, all these years. And a few months ago, I was in Mankato, Minnesota, <laughs> where I didn't expect to find a great movement. But there in Mankato, Minnesota, again, hundreds of people, and they told me about the, the Vietnam War days, when Mankato, Minnesota was rocking with anti-war action, where thousands of students, there's a branch of the University of Minnesota in Mankato, Minnesota, Thousands of students gathered in Mankato, Minnesota and blocked traffic and stopped everything from happening. And the police cooperated with them. There were too many of them to deal with. They don't have a big police force in Mankato, Minnesota. And so uh, uh, at one point, uh, an angry truck driver, because they had blocked the street, tried to uh, decided he wanted to just go through and the police captain stopped him and pulled him over and told him, no, you can't do that. Uh, but this is the kind of thing you see when you go around the country. You see, everywhere in this country there are people uh, who have been engaged, involved for many years. And you see new people who are beginning to get engaged and beginning to get involved for the first time. Uh, and. Uh, you forget very often when you, when you uh, are disconsolate at watching the, the news, uh, you forget that things have changed in this country, not at, very much at the top, not very much at the White House or in Congress or the Supreme Court, but things have changed in the minds of Americans over the years. Uh, that's something that's hard to measure, but it's there. 
And if you think about it, if you think of uh, 30 years ago uh, and the issue of sexual equality, and think of how 30 or 40 years ago, whether the issue of sexual equality was even on the agenda in the United States. Or think of the rights of gay people. I mean, that, that was something you couldn't even talk about 30 years ago in this country. There's been a change in the thinking of this country, uh, of lots and lots of people in this country. The, the movements of the 60s, the anti-war movement, the, the movement uh, for uh, the environment, uh, the movement of the disabled people, uh, the remarkable victories. I mean, now when you go through a, uh, a city and you see those indentations in the sidewalk, that didn't exist 30 years ago. And we forget that it took struggles, it took protest, it took lobbying, it took demonstrations, it took organization. Uh, but there have been victories. And, and, people, and people today in the United States, there's a great gap between the thinking of the people and the policies of the country. It's important to keep that in mind because th that gap is what at some point is going to produce another social movement in this country. Just as in the South, there was a great gap between the policy of the South and what was happening uh, below in the minds of people in the South. And not only black people, but even in the minds of white people who were beginning in the South who were beginning to think about uh, what they had been taught uh, about uh, what is right and what is wrong. Uh, I recently read a force to read because <laughs> I was I'd promised to review this book I, because I sort of intrigued by uh, the title of the book Telltale Hearts and, they, and, uh, and the, the Philadelphia Inquirer asked me to review it because they said well you'd, be in, you'd really be interested in this because it's a book about the, the movement against the war in Vietnam so I uh, any of you heard of it? Who's the author? A guy named... <laughs> uh, Roger, is that you who asked that question? You, why do you... You always ask a question which I can't answer. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to embarrass me on tape. <laughs> I think the book was recently reviewed in The Progressive. That's the reason I asked. Oh, was it recently reviewed in The Progressive? Ah. It wasn't me who reviewed it in the Progressive. Uh, uh, whoever it was. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I wasn't excited about remembering his name. Uh, Telltale Hearts is a book, as I said, about the movement against the war in Vietnam. And it's written by a conservative. And, uh, you know, one of the new conservatives, as opposed to the old conservatives, there's a whole new bunch of conservatives. And, uh, and it's a movement which, uh, the book is, is, a, is a book which uh, is not admiring of the anti-war movement. Uh, and uh, the title, Telltale Hearts, comes from the Edgar Allan Poe story. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the idea of the book is that, uh, you know, and you remember in, in that story there's the uh, this murder is committed, and the, the murderer buries, puts the body behind a wall to conceal it. But the police come, and the murderer begins to hear a heart beating. Oh, yeah. Yes, begins to hear a heart beating behind the wall. And the heartbeats get louder and louder and louder, and he, I uh, can't stand it anymore, he confesses. And the point that the writer makes is that uh, the Vietnam War remains as a heartbeat. The memory of that war remains in the American mind as a heartbeat which will not go away. And he says, and he doesn't like to say this, but he says it, he says, what the 60s did, what the anti-war movement did, what the other movements did was to create and use this phrase, a permanent adversarial culture in the United States. A permanent adversarial culture. 
I was heartened to read this. <laughs> And it's true. Uh, and uh, because most people in the United States, I mean, you can put aside if you want to the, you know, whatever those number of millions who listen to Rush Limbaugh, oh, uh, and maybe not even all of those, considering what little there is to listen to. And, but there, uh, there is, I believe, a very, very large number of people in this country, uh, and maybe a majority of people in this country. After all, we don't know. Uh, so only half the people go to the polls, right? Uh, and they go very unenthusiastically uh, because, well, as somebody, I saw a bumper sticker which said, um, if God, the gods intended us to vote, they would have given us candidates. <laughs> We know, so we know that there's a great alienation from the political system. Great alienation from the political system. And, uh, and it's interesting, when they do public opinion surveys, they find that the, there's a great gap between the policies of the two major parties and the desires of the American people. Uh, this was true even when Reagan was running and Reagan ran for, and Reagan won the presidency and yet the, the public opinion survey showed that most people in the United States did not really agree with Reagan's major policies, domestic or foreign. Uh, and when they, the surveys of public opinion over the last, oh, f five, eight years show that uh, the American people as a whole are far, far more eager to cut the military budget than either of the major parties. And that people, despite all the talk about, uh, oh, you know, welfare reform, uh, you know, those, those people on welfare, <laughs> they're taking an enormous amount of money from our taxes, right, 1% of, uh, 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 of the national budget. Um, and uh, I, I was just thinking, I'm sorry for this parenthetical remark, because I wanted that sentence to really go ahead very smoothly. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> I was just thinking about the, uh, the, the governor of Wisconsin, uh, whom, uh, whose Wisconsin plan for welfare was endorsed recently by President Clinton uh, and uh, 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 and Governor Thompson, right? Got Tommy Thompson, uh, uh, talking proudly about that welfare plan, said, from, from now on, nobody in Wisconsin, unless he's earned it. I thought, really? <laughs> uh, <laughs> corporations in Wisconsin? Uh, they're going to abolish public office in Wisconsin. But the surveys show that, that uh, people do not want the government to stop helping people in need. And it's interesting, it depends on how they word the question. If they ask people, uh, you know, are you against welfare? Oh, yes. But even the, the oh, yes for against welfare is only like 47%, you see. But if they ask them, do you think the government should help people who are in need? 68% yes. Do you think the government should help children? Yes. Do you think the government should spend more for education? Yes. Do you think that the government should do more for the environment? Yes. Do you think, you are, would you be willing to pay more taxes to do something about the environment? Yes. Now here the major party saying people don't want to be taxed, people don't want big government, people don't want welfare. There's this great gap between government policy and what people are thinking. And what I am suggesting is that there's an enormous reservoir of feeling and thought out in the country which is waiting to be organized. People don't want war. Uh, and people somehow, kn and people know that there's something wrong with a system uh, which enriches the top 1% 
of the population to the point where it owns 5.6 trillion dollars of wealth and uh, has a huge number of people uh, in the country who either don't have a home or don't have a, a decent home to live in and who can't pay for the education of their kids or mothers who have to take care of their kids and, and don't know what to do about uh, the problem of work and children and, and so there's a lot for us to do, and there's a, there's a basis for doing it, I believe, in the, in the, in the readiness of, of people to uh, accept what is said to them as common sense. And it is common sense, I think, and I find that wherever I go, and I, and I talk about this, and, the, and I don't usually talk to peace groups. I, I usually talk to who knows who I talk to. But, you know, I'll be invited to talk to California Polytechnic Institute in San Luis Obispo, California, and 900 engineering students will show up, you see. And if I, but if I tell them that I think war cannot solve anything, war is not the solution for whatever problems there are. There are real problems of tyranny in the world, real problems of aggression, real problems of injustice. They cannot be solved by war. People accept that, uh, especially if you give them a little historical information about wars. Um, anyway, uh, all of this is to say uh, that I think we... Uh, well, we have an enormous job to do in organizing the people of this country into a great new social movement to, to end war and to use the, the wealth that has been siphoned off towards war and militarism, use that great wealth to create a very decent society, a home for everybody. Uh, it's a job that, that can be done uh, or so long as we persist. Uh, so long as we don't set goals for ourselves, we've got to do it in three years, two years, right? Uh, so long as we, uh, yes, so long as we fail to quit. <laughs> um, uh, well, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Do you want to take two or three questions? Sure, yes. sure, sure, sure. Uh, Well, let me say one other thing before the uh, questions, and, and that is, uh, if, you, um, if you pick up uh, Michael Ferber's book on Shelley, which is not hard to pick up, it's a very light book. Uh, I mean, in weight, I mean, you've got to admit it, uh, Michael, it's, uh, uh, but it, it's an uh, it's, uh, eloquent, a beautiful book. But you will find in it, uh, of course, uh, not only Michael's commentary, but you'll find snatches of Shelley's poetry. And one of them uh, sort of sticks uh, with me as something that, that uh, we, we should all keep in mind. Uh, and it was a poem that, that Shelley wrote. Michael can t tell you all about it. But uh, and I, and I, I think it's from The Mask of Anarchy. The one, the one, am I right about this, Michael? The one that starts, rise like, li rise like lions uh, after slumber in unvanquishable number. Shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. So, anyway. so thank you, Michael. We have time for maybe two or three questions or comments for Howard. Howard, I'll let you call on you. Oh, sure. You know, you know how. Roger, is this, am I going to be able to answer this? At the <laughs> recent Socialist Scholars Conference, I traded five tapes for an original pamphlet entitled Deportation is Meaning and Menace, Last Message to the People of America by Alexander Berkman and Emma Goldman. This was written on Ellis Island in December of 1919. Now, you, you just mentioned anarchy, and 
You know, we look around today, the graffiti on the wall, we see the round circle and the A. There's a movie out now called Land and Freedom, which is based upon uh, uh, Orwell's book, Homage to Catalonia. Yet, the media, our high school teachers, and so on, would make us think that anarchy is people running around, throwing bombs, killing people, chaos and confusion. Can you just sort of say a few words about anarchy and you, the future in America? Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd like to talk for a while about anarchy. <laughs> Roger, please. <laughs> no, well, no, it's true that uh, that anarchism is, you know, is, is you know misread and, and, and misinterpreted as violence and bomb throwing, as if those other, you know, everybody else, you know, all the other people, they're all pacifists, only the anarchists, yeah, <laughs> there were a few bomb throwing anarchists, let's admit it, uh, uh, but most anarchists, uh, that's not the basis of anarchist philosophy, the best thing I can suggest to everybody is read Emma Goldman's autobiography, Living My Life, a wonderful reading experience, how many of you have read Living My Life? Will you agree? A wonderful book to read. Emma Goldman's autobiography, Living My Life. Um, any other easy questions? <laughs> yes. You know, we look around today, the graffiti on the wall, we see the round circle and the A. There's a movie out now called Land and Freedom, which is based upon uh, uh, Orwell's book, Homage to Catalonia. Yet, the media, our high school teachers, and so on, would make us think that anarchy is people running around, throwing bombs, killing people, chaos and confusion. Can you just sort of say a few words about anarchy and you, its future in America? Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd like to talk for a while about <laughs> anarchy. <laughs> Roger, please. <laughs> no, well, no, it's true that uh, that anarchism is, you know, is, is you know misread and, and, and misinterpreted as violence and bomb throwing, as if those other, you know, everybody else, you know, all the other people, they're all pacifists, only the anarchists, yeah, <laughs> there were a few bomb throwing anarchists, let's admit it, uh, uh, but most anarchists, uh, that's not the basis of anarchist philosophy, the best thing I can suggest to everybody is read Emma Goldman's autobiography, Living My Life, a wonderful reading experience. How many of you have read Living My Life? Will you agree? A wonderful book to read. Emma Goldman's autobiography, Living My Life. Um, any other easy questions? <laughs> yes. One of my favorite books in my youth was Oscar Amarino's Great oh, Point yeah. If You Don't Eat Weekend. Does anybody else have ever read that book? Uh, yes. He was a very funny guy. Could you repeat who that was so everyone can yeah, hear a bit of what the book was? Yeah, you want to tell people? It was an autobiography of Oscar Armour, who was a socialist during World War I. And for a considerable time later, since I didn't read him until the late 